What's happening, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Crash Bang Boom Drumming Podcast. Today's guest is drummer Jeff Conrad of Phantom Planet, who also played a Minnesota ska band, The Siren Six, the latter of which relocated to Los Angeles in the late 90s, which is how Jeff ended up out there, and the, which is also a cool story that I was able to speak to him about. But we got into everything from his early impressions of Los Angeles, how I came across the Phantom Planet record Raise the Dead, which I love very much to this day and whose vocalist is one of my all-time favorites, for real, in Alex Greenwald. Dude is so good. As well as Jeff's first kit, Guns N' Roses being the gateway to playing the drums. As well as some info on the reunited Phantom Planet and a little bit on their new record due out early this year. I'll also put a link in the description in this episode uh, to a documentary that Jeff produced and edited on the history of his band, The Siren Six, which is super cool. So make sure to check it out. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Luminary, Podbean, and more, as well as my SoundCloud and YouTube pages. If you like what you hear, feel free to check out any of the previous 170 plus episodes and hit that subscribe button. Or give me a positive review and or any and all of that. Por favor. Speaking of records, shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking to release your project on vinyl, go on over to neworleansrecordpress.com to check out the mini packaging, coloring, and more options. Plus, they have a real-time quote generator for you to keep tabs on all that stuff. They also print both 12 and 7 inch records in 150 and 180 gram variants, and they offer mastering, precision, lacquer cutting, electroplating, and more. All the services. Hit them up, and that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. All righty then. Here we go. Jeff Conrad, Phantom Planet, Siren 6. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. All right, Jeff Conrad, uh, what's happening, man? How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Doing pretty good myself, man. It's a, it's a pretty uh, kind of uncommon winter here in New York, so it's not, not brutally cold. Uh, but I, I know apparently if, if you're back in Minnesota, that might not be the case where you are, I imagine. Uh, yeah, we had some, I think it was negative seven for most of today. But um, Wow. Yeah, last week we had a, a blizzard, but it was maybe 20 degrees and so that's that's like perfect weather like take the kids outside (laughs) they eat the snow and yesterday there were some we had four deer running through our backyard and they could barely get through all the snow it was it was like a disney movie damn dude well man you uh you have an interesting distinction in that you've been part of not one but two reunions of your former bands which is really interesting uh one of which of course is phantom planet uh who i'm int- definitely interested to talk to you about and i know y'all came through new york uh i unfortunately missed that show but i know y'all had some other ones around that time tell me a little bit about i guess uh getting back together and uh how did those shows go and you know what was the impetus for for getting back yeah, the, sh- the recent shows were amazing. Um, it's weird to say like we got back together because now that we're back together, it doesn't feel like we are ever apart. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we, we would always, we'd always still hang out and um, we even started getting back together like four years ago and we'd rehearse at our singer's house and we're writing new songs. Um, and then stuff would just kind of get in the way and, and uh, all of a sudden it had been like two years since we'd played. Um, but we always wanted to do this and, um, it was just kind of a matter of getting everyone's schedules lined up. And, um, so finally all of our schedules kind of cleared up and yeah, so it really started, I think, beginning of last year of 2019, I flew out to LA and we did sort of a surprise friends and family show and then we went into the studio we went into sound city for a week and i tracked 10 songs on drums and then we've been finishing that up the rest of this year and and actually just as of this as of tonight uh, i just got the mastered version of the album and it's completely done no way yeah wow and yeah we just had a, a band call and we're um, planning shows and kind of planning everything for the rest of the year. Nice, man. I, ho- I hope y'all come back through New York. I'd definitely like to see it. How are you feeling about the album and, and that, that whole process? The album's pretty amazing. Um, it's, it's nice because when we were together before, we were on a label and Raise the Dead was like an epic journey of to, to release that album. It was, we were, we started it on Sony and then 
we worked on it with them for a couple of years and then um, we left them and released it on Fueled by Ramen. But it, it, I don't know, maybe it only took like two years, but it felt like four years. Like it, it felt like a really long time. Yeah. And this one, by contrast, was really, really fast. Yeah, I mean, just my, my drumming alone, just a week of drums and that's it was really, really fun. And um, it was weird, like coming into making this album, having not really played in other than um, some other shows. Right. Having not played in a long time. And I also just had like two or three takes per song and we'd never really played them as a band before. So um, right. that was that was strange. Just like, what's your first instinct? Hopefully it's good enough. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm really excited that we're back. Nice. And then I guess with the geographical differences of everybody, where was there just a lot of file sharing and you're just kind of <laughs> learning the jams on your own and practicing and hoping when you show up uh, with minimal practice that you're not botching the studio session? <laughs> yeah, uh, I definitely did have to practice on my own a little bit, which, you know, as a drummer is, is, is not super fun, but um, I really had to rehearse more for our, our shows to make sure that I had the endurance and all that. But um I didn't quite rehearse for, for the recording because uh, I didn't really know. I kind of barely knew what songs we were doing. Wow. How much time did you have to rehearse before recording those those parts? There's a song, Time Moves On, we'd never played before as a band. And so, yeah, what you hear on the record is like our, our first impressions of the song. <laughs> wow. And yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, you know, it'll definitely sound like Phantom Planet to everyone, but I, I think it's it's definitely a more, I think Raise the Dead like is a crazy, crazy record, uh, just totally. bombastic. And mm-hmm. there's still some of those moments on here, but I think it's it's definitely more mature and maybe more restrained. Right. I think it just kind of comes with age. Right on. Definitely psyched to hear it, man. That's that's amazing yeah. that you got the, the, the master today of all days as well, so we can talk about yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> Well, going back to one of the other bands that I previously mentioned in the Siren Six, uh, I dug the documentary that you did on the band, which, oh, which cool. uh, as I was saying, culminated in a reunion as well. So you got your two reunions there. But uh, <laughs> tell me a little bit about uh, that band and uh, your journey uh, of going out to L.A. from the Midwest and kind mm. of that that world that you immersed yourself in uh, in L.A. and kind of just trying to make sense of it all when you're young and crazy enough to go to LA as like an inspired band, you know? Yeah, that was a much different time. And, uh, so the Siren Six was a band that was started in Minneapolis around 96, I want to say. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, at that time it was before the internet really. And, uh, to get exposure, you really had to, we believed you had to either be in New York or LA and we, uh, knew one person in LA and we didn't know anyone in New York. <laughs> and so we kind of, <laughs> well, uh, one is better than none. So yeah, we, we pretty much moved to LA, uh, in 98. And that one person that we knew, she happened to be friends with the guys in Phantom Planet. And then the guys, they were in a band called Karis Flowers who eventually became Rune 5. And so wow. we became really fast friends and we'd always play shows together. And the Siren Six moved out to LA with the intention of getting a record deal. And, you know, we were young. I was 18 or 19. No, I was, I was 20. Still young. Still young. We naively thought we'd get a record deal in about six months and mm-hmm. um, we would just move back to Minneapolis. Some of us even kept our apartment leases there. And, you know, we pretty much moved out there with the clothes on our back and piled into a, a three bedroom apartment with seven of us. Wow. And um, so, yeah, cut to about a year later, no record deal. Uh, The band kind of disintegrates, and I stay in L.A. and form a a rock band with two of the other guys. And then um, Phantom Planet's drummer left the band, and I, you know, talked to Phantom Planet, and, and they really wanted me to join, and it just seemed like an amazing opportunity to be a full-time musician and being in Phantom Planet at that time was just unbelievable. I mean, we tour in Japan and, you know, just tour all over the world and wow. play on all the late shows. And it was, it was just an unbelievable time. It was so much fun. 
So you went out, I mean, well, that's kind of ironic. You went out to LA, figured you'd give yourself six months for one thing to materialize with one band, and then you find yourself in another band that's already established, and then you're touring the world with that band, and you make this crazy record. It's, it's wild, man. Yeah, I mean, crazy things can happen in LA if you stick around long enough and you keep a cool head on your shoulders, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, that town is full of dreamers, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I got very lucky, but I also think just being a drummer, like drummers are good. Drummers are in short supply. I think there's, you know, everyone kind of wants to be a singer or in the spotlight. And I think, um, there's just not a lot of great drummers. I don't think not, I'm not saying that I am a great drummer. I'm just saying there's not a lot of great drummers. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, right. What was your initial impression, uh, as a 20 some odd year old, uh, showing up in LA initially? And what was that kind of world like? Cause it sounded like y'all kind of fell into a scene with m- really minimal connections somehow. Yeah. I mean, my impression of LA, first thing that comes to mind is that everybody hugs hello in LA. Even if you're like meeting someone for the first time, you might hug them hello, yeah. which, uh, nice. which you don't do in the Midwest. Right. Uh, which I do now, and I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the weather, I imagine? Yeah, the weather, sure. I mean, it, you know, Minneapolis actually had a great music scene. Mm. So coming to L.A. was a little tough. I mean, you know, you'd play places like the like the Whiskey, you know, places on the Sunset Strip, and it was, it was pretty far from, you know, Siren Six was a, a very DIY band, and... Mm-hmm. I think we we struggled a bit to sort of fit into the mold in LA. I'd imagine there wasn't much of a ska scene, so to speak, there, right? There, there was a little bit of ska scene more more down in Orange County. I mean, we when we first moved there, we played a show with Fishbone, and no doubt were there just as they were. I mean, that was '98, so I think um, Tragic Kingdom had been out, and they were you know really skyrocketing, and right. And it's it's crazy. We would, um, you know, back then before websites and email, we would physically hand people our CDs with just our home phone number on it, not a cell phone number. So we gave our CD to Gwen and Tony with our phone number just in case they wanted a band to open for them or whatever. Right. And um, a couple of weeks later, we got a call on our answering machine from uh, the guitar player saying, hey, Gwen and Tony, play me your CD. I'd really like a copy. Can you mail me a copy of your CD? <laughs> and oh that to God. us was like the biggest deal ever. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing. Years later, Phantom Planet opened for No Doubt. And I, I brought that up to them. And they're like, oh, my God, we would listen to that CD all the time. And they, they started singing it back to me. <laughs> no way. That's crazy. So that was cool. Um Absolutely. But yeah, you know, I think being a, a ska band in LA trying to get a record deal, I think we kind of arrived. We went out to LA thinking, oh, Rancid is on MTV. They got a record deal. They pro- they're probably right. just handing out record deals to ska bands. And of course, by the time we get there, like ska is, you know, it's in its death rattle. And, um, right. and no one wants to take a chance on a ska band because the next thing is coming up, whatever that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did your parents think about y'all all going out to, out to LA? My parents were supportive. I don't really think they had a choice. I mean, I I I knew f- for a long time that music was all I wanted to do, and there was really no backup plan. But yeah, I mean, I have kids now, and the thought of them at you know eighteen or nineteen moving out to LA, I would be horrified, and <laughs> I, I can't bad. imagine saying yes to that. <laughs> Amazing. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I asked my dad about it and he says, you know, I, I never worried about you. So for whatever reason, they didn't worry about me. Well, I guess going back to uh, pre The Siren 6, how did you start playing in the first place? Uh, and uh, tell me a little bit about maybe what your first drum set was and maybe, you know, why the why the drums in the first place and or like were there any drummers at the time that you were really digging when you first started playing? Got into drums at age 13 pretty much because I saw Guns N' Roses on MTV and I thought that looked like a lot of fun. And (laughs) that's hilarious. (laughs) And my buddy was also into Guns N' Roses and he was already playing guitar. And so I thought if we wanted to be a band, I should probably play the drums. 
there there wasn't much thought beyond that really. There were, I'd never really thought about the drums before. It was just sort of like a practical decision. Yeah. And um, yeah, my first drum set, my mom had a friend who said they had a you know an old Ludwig Blue Sparkle in their basement that they weren't using and that they would give it to me, which was incredibly generous and like a great drum set. Wow. And um, yeah, I just started on that. I took a couple lessons and then. I went to a rock school at the local music store in the summer and ended up meeting the guys, um, like two of the guys that would eventually be in the Siren Six. So I pretty much played with them from age 13 until whenever that band dissolved. Wow. But yeah, I mean, I I was into some really bad music at the time. I mean, (laughs) you know, the stuff I was into was like Primus and, of course, you know, hair metal and really really bad stuff and and the guys in the siren six turned me on to pixies and really really good ska yeah and um so i I really you know got into into good music once i started playing with them so the way that i actually heard about uh the phantom planet record uh raise the dead that you played on um is that i worked at a subsidiary of viacom here in New York, I believe it was 98, the, the year that I, I think that record came out. But uh, there would be a bin in the hall of promo CDs that I guess just <laughs> get sent out to like major networks or whatever. And uh, I would always sift through there and see what I could find. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I came across the Raise the Dead record and thought the cover was interesting enough to warrant further exploration, uh, which is funny because, you know, much like it was when I was a kid where you take a chance on a record or a tape because of the cover art. Uh, and you'd be like, all right, I'm going to check it out. Only in this case, you know, it was admittedly free. Uh, so all I'd lose, worst case scenario, was a little bit of time as opposed to when I was young where my 10 or 12 or $15 of grass cut and money might have gone awry <laughs> with uh, with the, the, the tape or the record that I bought that I didn't like. I, I really loved it from the first track, from the opening title track. And I oh, thought awesome. uh, Alex's voice was awesome. And the production of the record was really cool. And I just immediately liked it. And flash forward, I started DJing around that time. Oh, wow. And I would occasionally play some of the songs off that record because they kind of meshed well with either some of the like kind of punk jams or like the angular early stuff like Elvis Costello. I could actually Mm -hmm. like fit in some of the the songs off that record, uh, which is interesting. So whenever I listen to it, it actually reminds me of the earlier days in for me in New York when I was DJ and playing some of those songs and when I found that in a record bin in a hallway. Uh, so that is actually how I discovered your record. <laughs> oh, that's super cool. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned uh, Elvis Costello. I was just thinking about him. So I'm back in Minnesota. I'm actually in Rochester, Minnesota, and I mm-hmm. befriended a, a local drummer. And he has a um, he started a drummer's brunch, which I went to a couple of weeks ago. And nice. surprisingly, there was like 20 drummers that showed up, like all different ages and styles of playing, and you just hang out and talk drums. And I think I I brought up Pete Thomas as one of my favorite drummers, and I don't know if anyone knew him, and I'm. It's just such a shame. Like Pete Thomas is one of my favorites and I'm always, uh, I'll talk about him any chance I can get. He's just the best. Is he the guy that played on uh, most of those early Elvis Costello records? Yeah. So he's the attractions drummer. Um, so gotcha. not on the, not Love the first album, but pretty much uh, the second album through, God, I don't know. I mean, at least 15, like the first 15 years of Elvis Costello. Awesome. Um, but he, he's, he's just, uh, yeah, he's definitely one of my top guys. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that earlier sort of angular, dancey punk stuff like Elvis Costello yeah. and Joe Jackson and all that yeah. stuff is very much the prototype uh, for what would happen in New York kind of in the later, uh, in the like the two thousand mid-2000s, I guess, or whatever. Uh, it's interesting when that sort of no wave sort mm-hmm. of dance punk thing kind of came back in New York. Uh, but when I yeah. when I actually heard your that record that you're on that we're talking about, I was like, this kind of sounds like it could be in that scene that was starting to happen mm. with the yeah, yeah, yeahs and some of those bands in New York. So I thought it was interesting that y'all were out in LA because I kind of felt like y'all were more a part of what was going on in New York at the time. That's cool. You know, I feel like a lot of our fans, for a lot of our fans, The Guest is their favorite record. Mm-hmm. And then the self-titled album after that is sort of like really extreme, like 
the farthest you could get from from the pop of that album. And then I think Race the Dead was sort of somewhere in between. And, yes, um, agreed. So yeah, I think when we toured on that album, we were sort of trying to find our audience again. And it's funny, like, you know, if if I meet someone for the first time and say I'm in a band and I'll say I'm in a band called Phantom Planet, sometimes, you know, people are like, oh, I think I've heard of you. And then I'll mention our song California and they're like of course. oh my god I know that song <laughs> yeah so I think a lot of people know our music before they know our band yes which is cool I think that song that song is just sort of like part of the atmosphere and like oh it totally belong to us yeah right I mean I think if most people's awareness of the band came through that song because it was it yeah. was on pretty heavy rotation on the radio on MTV all yeah. of that um which is which is interesting once again because I definitely associated the band with that song, um, yeah. which which I was kind of felt like I was oversaturated with. So in hindsight, I'm kind of impressed that I was even willing to be like, ah, you know, I'll check out a record from these guys. And then I was like, oh, this is kind of I felt like it was a different thing. I just wasn't expecting it, and I totally dug it. Which is yeah. once again such a bizarre scenario and one that's just kind of etched in my mind and very specific because uh, it was just so bizarre the way I came across it. But um, one question about said record cover that features you know all of the members uh, taped up to what I'm assuming was a floor, and then the shot was was uh from oh, no, above no. no it's to the oh left. is that vertical y'all were oh you bet you bet that's real are you serious oh yeah really god damn it what how did y'all get <laughs> taped up to a vertical wall with all of your instruments that seems like that's a fucking a lot, complete pain <laughs> a lot of duct tape you know i don't i don't know if anyone thought to just tape us to the floor but um no we're we were seriously up there <laughs> it took a lot of duct tape Oh my god! Uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't terribly comfortable to be honest, and like I no. couldn't wait to I I was like having a panic attack like get me get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! Because the 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 cover of it is is it just Alex? It's just Alex? That's, is, yeah, yeah. Okay, but then when you open up like the 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 the, the inner uh, yeah. sleeve or whatever, it's it's all of the members that had to go through that with their instruments. So it's such a crazy cover, and like the whole <laughs> art and the idea is hilarious, and it's so it's just outrageous, man. So one question about that recording, and you mentioned that the process of getting it out um, sounded like it was a pretty arduous task, but the drum recording is really interesting to me in that uh, it's one of those records where the drums are very dampened and kind of Mm. electronic, uh, and that kind of electronic dance influence, and I dig that. So I guess tell me a little bit about the experience of of recording drums for that record. Um, Well, I'll have to talk about our engineer, who is Sean Everett who um, who is now like, I don't know how many Grammys he's won, but he's like the go-to engineer now. If you look him up, he's he's like, he's the guy. Wow. Um, uh, but he, when we started with him, he was this young kid from Canada and, um, you know, he just kind of landed in LA and was working with our producer, Tony Berg, at Tony's um, home studio. And my experience with engineers up to that point is that, you know, I would go in there to play the drums and they would start to mic them up and it felt very like clinical and like just not, um, just not like a great recording, like just not a great environment to play drums in. Like I'd be like, oh, I need to put this mic here. Can you raise your cymbal up or can you play a little, you know, like, yeah, of course, <laughs> just like not, not a, not a great experience. And Sean would come in and, I wouldn't even realize that we were mic'd up because he would just be cracking jokes the whole time and having so much fun. And then um, all of a sudden he'd be like, uh, Jeff, I, I think we got a, I think we got a take. Come listen to this. It sounds great. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he's such a goofy guy. He carries around um, his own hot sauce anywhere he goes. He just has his own hot sauce. That's the kind of guy that he is. Yeah, I'm a fan uh, of hot sauce too. I've got easily like eight of them. I have them at my desk at work. I put hot sauce on fucking everything. I'm also from Louisiana, so just being from the South and just being exposed to spicy food. I mean, I don't think I'd put it on a peanut butter sandwich, but I mean, shit, I might actually put hot sauce on a peanut butter sandwich. So I get it. <laughs> but yeah, re- recording drums for that record, I sort of had to shift how I thought about the the tracks because I think a lot of those songs we'd been playing live and as I understood it, the goal 
was to capture on the recording all the awesome stuff that I've been playing live. Mm. And I think I learned on that record that the recording is a much different experience than the live show. And so I think there's a little bit of, of give and take with that on the record. Right. I think I've, I've finally learned to accept that I don't have to hit a crash cymbal all the time. I don't have to... By the end of the record, the last song I did was actually the last song on the record, um, I Don't Mind. Right on. I came in and Sean, the engineer, had covered the entire drum set with with a bed sheet. And um, he was just like, Jeff, this is the, the approach we're going to try, or like a real muted drum sound. And I was like, yeah, sounds fun. Let's see what happens. Right. And, you know, this is not a song that we had played live. And, you know, I, I think I really learned on that record to, you know, play what serves the recording. And it doesn't matter what I've been playing live. Like, let's just figure out what works for the record. And yeah, that, that was definitely more the like the approach straight away with with the new album that we just recorded playing live and recording in the studio are, are really really different and yeah i think when you're young um it's it's hard to grasp that and hard to you know separate the two and yes understand what's what's good to play and when i was younger there was so much ego involved in my drumming because that was sort of all that i had mm-hmm. and I was like, I, I got to get like the best possible drum take, <laughs> you know, and now I just, I just don't care. Like it's, it's just not a big, it's just not a big deal. It's, it's like, I'll play something and if it's good, it's good. And if not, no big deal. Like it's fine. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I think there's losing your ego is important. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, just when you joined the band and obviously Jason Schwartzman as the original drummer that you replaced. Having, uh, I'm just wondering when you joined the band, did you occasionally get the, wait, you're not the actor guy uh, comments <laughs> at all? <laughs> there, were def- there was one or two times where someone just decided that I was Jason. Um, I-, I don't know if they'd never seen what he looked like. They must have heard yeah. that he was in the band, but didn't. Yeah, that was only like the first year or so. I don't know. It, it only happened rarely enough that it was amusing. It, it definitely wasn't annoying at all. Good. Yeah, yeah. one of these days I, I might have to actually catch up with him because uh, I, I think it's really interesting that in you know '98 the first Phantom Planet record comes out, and then in '98 also his like breakout role in Rushmore, the Wes Anderson movie, yeah. came it came out in '98. So I'm I, I've, I'm just kind of curious is like how the hell did he juggle uh, recording a record and putting out a record and filming like this 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 pretty incredible movie? It's one of those bizarre things. You know, yeah. uh, do you, do you talk to him at all? Or, or, uh, did you, did you, I guess when you joined the band, did you, did you hang with him at all? Or, uh, there wasn't any sort of passing of the torch, but I, I did learn later. One of the guys in the band, it might've been Alex said that at one time, Jason said, if I ever leave the band, I want Jeff to take my place, which I thought was really Oh, interesting. Cool. I probably only seen him like twice since I um, replaced him in the band. I don't think he's been wow. in the show. Um, wow. but he's just the nicest guy. And, um, you know, he's just, he's got that thing. Like when you talk to him, he will make you feel like the most important person in the room for the five minutes that he talks to you. And he'll go and do that with every single person in the room, which is really an incredible thing. <laughs> That's a hell of a quality. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. <laughs> No, oh but he's God. a really sweet guy. And, and I, I mean, when I went to Phantom Planet shows, he was the one that I would watch. He was incredibly entertaining. And there, there was a rumor for a while that he was going to do a, a Keith Moon movie, which I think would be incredible. I think he'd be, he would nail that. Oh, my God. I can totally see it. That would be amazing. Yeah. So someone's got to do that still. Damn, man. Well, uh, post Phantom Planet, uh, what did you find yourself doing out there? And uh, I guess how long ago did you move uh, out to back out to Minnesota? So yeah, post Phantom Planet, uh, we went on a hi- hiatus, uh, two thousand eight, right around there, maybe two thousand eight through two thousand nine. Um, I kind of got, I jumped right into film editing which I'd, I'd started to do while I was in the band. I would film us on the road and just edit together funny little things. I was really um, yeah. 
we were super into Tim and Eric at that time. I mean, we still love Tim and Eric, but mm -hmm. I, I loved their the style that they would edit their videos in. And so I would film us doing stuff and sort of adapt a Tim and Eric editing style. And, um, but then when, yeah, when the band went on hiatus, I was pretty frustrated with the music business, I guess. And I just wanted something like a steady, reliable job. And I just really loved film editing and, um, got into that and, you know, I've been editing documentaries now for 10 years or so. Nice. And, and that sort of led me, kind of led me right back to music because in film editing, you still need to use a ton of music. Right. And I would try to get instrumental songs and inevitably there'd be like an annoying guitar solo that would come in to this nice instrumental track. And then I thought, man, I could just like make some instrumentals and, so I started doing that. It's interesting, man. I too work in post-production and editing and whatnot, and have worked on you know documentaries, one of my own as well. So we do share that and drumming, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's one of those things. Initially, when when other people or, or if I was working with editors, uh, they they would say, "Hey, will you pay, what do you think about some music for this?" And I would always <laughs> kind of say, "You know, I'm probably not your barometer for music for anything because everything I listened to was so esoteric and fucking outrageous. And I, at least I guess from like a pop sensibility." standpoint but more uh -huh. recently I, i've i've seen it more as a challenge that i have to accept and be like is this music that that works for this and <laughs> that people you know all of this stuff generally i like it's really funny it's something that i thought about recently that i've kind of sh I, for so many years i shied away from even giving any input despite the fact that i'm going on 30 years of playing and creating music uh <laughs> as to how what music would work within the the very sphere and post-production in which I've worked in now for 17 years. Uh, so I only recently realized that. So now that I'm in my forties, I guess I'm, you know, you got to learn something sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh my God, man. So Sorry. you also asked about, um, uh, moving back here. Yes. So I got into film editing and then I met my, um, future wife. Well, we, we actually grew up together in Madison, Wisconsin. Gotcha. And we, we reconnected on MySpace. Old school. Old school. Uh, <laughs> so she was living in San Francisco at the time. She's uh, a doctor, so she was in residency at UCSF. Gotcha. And we started dating long distance. This was when Phantom Planet was touring a whole bunch. So um, we were both like pretty busy with, with work, but we would you know get together once or twice a month. And then when she finished, finished residency, she moved down to L.A., and we were down there for a while. And then when the band went on hiatus, she wasn't enjoying being a doctor in LA. And so we tried to go back to San Francisco where she trained. And then by that point we had two kids and uh, raising two kids in San Francisco was, was not financially viable. <laughs> and luckily- Oh, I hear you. Luckily she got offered a job at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So we moved here about a year and a half ago and we're just loving it. Nice, man. Yeah. Yeah. So we're closer to, uh, to where we grew up in Madison and, um, yeah, just a much more manageable life here. Awesome, man. Very, very ironic that, that Phantom Planet finally got back together just as I <laughs> left California. <laughs> but, um, oh my God, but, man. But it's great. Speaking of Phantom Planet, I guess, what are the future plans beyond uh, getting this record out? Yeah, so it looks like the record comes out in May. Okay. And we should have maybe two two to three weeks worth of shows around that. And um, yeah, so I mean, we're, you know, when we were a band before, we had a record label and we had kind of the whole machine behind us. And now... We're sort of starting over from scratch with, we, we just have a manager who's wonderful. And, um, you know, you know, when we were a band before, there wasn't social media, there wasn't any of that stuff. And um, it's amazing now to have all that and to reach our fans through there. Uh, but yeah, we're kind of just taking things slowly, like seeing what works for us. But yeah, definitely some shows. And beyond that, it's kind of, yeah, we had a meeting today with a lot of, exciting developments and we're going to have another meeting next week. Um, but yeah, mostly getting this record out is going to be pretty major, I think. 
Awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm definitely looking yeah. forward to hearing it. Um, I hope yeah. y'all come back t- to, to New York. I'm pretty, yeah, we'll definitely be back. Yeah. Nice. If, if, yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to catch up with you for real, uh, this time. That'd be great. Yeah, man. Well, cool, dude. It was, uh, it was good talking to you. I'm, I'm glad to, to catch up with you. Nice talking to you too. And, uh, like I said, it's, 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 trippy talking to you uh i could have obviously not having uh, seen into the future know that i would do a drumming podcast and talk to the drummer of this record that i that i was like totally into you know and that i found in a <laughs> record awesome. bin so it's uh the the circle of life can be a, a bizarre scenario sometimes and this Absolutely. is clearly one of those <laughs> cool cool man well uh jeff have a good one man i hope 2020 treats you well absolutely you too I will uh, catch up with you when y'all come through New York. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging. Hope you enjoyed the episode. It's great catching up with Jeff. Super cool dude. And I look forward to Phantom Planet putting out this new record and hopefully coming back through New York. I'm definitely a fan of them. I got some killer jams and some ridiculously awesome singing. In any case, we'll catch you on the next one. Crash, bang, boom. Boom.